Hello and welcome to this week's look at action and stunts on film and television. How are you? Good to see you again. Um, as you will note if you have uh, listened to this week's podcast, the podcast is 100 episodes long uh, this week. 100 episodes, can you believe it? We started back in, um, 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 what, back end of 2020, I guess? Uh, Christmas Day 2020? We've come a long way. We've covered a lot of ground, and um, we've we've tried to explore a whole bunch of bits and pieces. And it just so happened that this particular week, um, we fall into the category of um, an ex-Bond. And the reason that I've reverted back to this, obviously we started with Bond, uh, we started with Dr. No way back when. But the reason for this, I've had an argument with people for so long um, and I think that George Lazenby is very underrated not only as a Bond I mean I think we, we, we've understood there is a base level where people coming into the franchise for the first time they watch the Connery movies they think hey this guy's fantastic and then they watch Honor Majesties and they go I'm not so sure and then Sean comes back and then Roger takes over. But as it's been proved, Honor Majesty's Secret Service is a very, very powerful movie and um, certainly one of the very best cinematic experiences through the entire franchise. It's down to a couple of things. One of those things is the physicality of George Lazenby. As an actor, and he wasn't an actor, let's be fair, that wonderful story, of how he raced up the stairs, was confronted with Harry Saltzman. I wonder, incidentally, if he'd got the role, if he'd been confronted by Cubby. But he went up the stairs and he was confronted by Harry Saltzman, who said, you're an actor? OK, where have you worked before? And he said, well, I've worked in, in uh, Hong Kong and uh, oh, in Yugoslavia and Luxembourg and all these other places, because he didn't think that they could be able to check it out. And he said, OK, cool, um, well, come back and, and we'll, we'll arrange a, a date on such and such a date. And then they got him to come back and he spoke to Peter Hunt and he said, Peter, I can't keep this any longer, I have to tell you. He said, tell me what? He said, uh, I'm not an actor. He said, you what? He said, I'm not an actor. He said, but you've convinced two of the biggest names in Hollywood. He said, you're an actor. He said, stick with your story. I'll make you James Bond. And that's more or less along the lines of what happened. The balls of the guy to be able to step up and go, I'm going to have that role. And he wanted it because he wanted it more than anybody else. So he says himself but also because of his physicality. Now, um, I have been saying, just going back to that point, I've been saying for a long, long time that George throws, for me, I believe the, one of the greatest screen punches I've ever seen. Actors, they learn how to throw punches. And um, they do them very well. Roger Moore is a very good example of a man who throws an exceptionally good punch but certainly wouldn't do it in public because he's, you know, was a pacifist and was found it very difficult to uh, have a, an ounce of confrontation. He would step away from that sort of thing. George wouldn't step away from that sort of thing. George liked a dust-up. Um, if you've ever seen Becoming Bond, you've ever seen any interviews with George, he would say himself, he would go out on a Friday night or a Saturday night, he'd go down to the local bar out in the bush, because he's from that neck of the woods, um, and, you know, at some point during the course of the evening, there'd be a punch-up. He'd have a few beers, he'd have a punch-up, and he'd go home with some glamorous girl. And that was it. That was Fridays and Saturday nights for God knows how long. So he knew how to handle himself. Now, there were a number of boxes that needed to be ticked along the way for him to secure the Bond role in the eyes of the producers. One of which involved action. And even though 
apparently they sent a girl up to his room to make sure that he wasn't gay. The stuff you used to do back in the 60s, eh? Um, but the fighting thing, that's important because, as we've seen ourselves, and there were a number of... There's some great um, footage. If you go to my channel, you'll, you'll, you'll see uh, some footage of Bob Simmons running through... Was it for that interim period between... Um, George leaving and Sean coming back for diamonds. I think it may well have been. Um, so that initial piece, it was like a, um, a thing for diamonds are forever. And a, a guy comes in and there's a fight with um, uh, with Bob Simmons. And they ha have this whole little routine going on. Now, the guy was looked pretty good. But very clearly, I think he was, was he a rugby player? He may have been a rugby player, not an actor. And certainly part way through the routine, Bob Simmons actually grabs hold of him and says, and throw me, you know, throw me. <laughs> and so it was a very, one of those moments where he said, look, I'm try, trying to move this thing along. You didn't need to do that with George. George was the personification of physical. And uh, Yuri Boryenko um, was made fully aware of this because during that fight George learned that the screen punch is very different to your average Friday or Saturday night dust up down the bar and um, whilst there were you know moves going here and throwing about left right and centre George lamped him and he landed one and uh, not only did he land one, broke his nose. And we've seen the pictures of Yuri walking away with blood pouring down his face and everybody going, Ooh, and just attending to him and dabbing him with tissue and all that sort of stuff. Um, because George, something clicked in his mind that said, oh, I'm in a fight. And he just, instinct, natural instinct took over. And he did. Now, on the strength of that, that's what got him the role. Absolutely. Good-looking guy. All right. Wasn't an actor, but a good-looking guy and could be moulded to the way in which the producers wanted. But more importantly, as we found out in the past, if there is a lull in proceedings, if there is a bit of a lull whereby... Maybe the story needs pushing on a bit. Maybe we just need to cool the narrative for a moment and push the action side from just to push things along. George was uh, action personified. He was magnificent. And the fights, the physical fights in Honor Majesties, for me, I think, are some of the very, very best in the series, if not cinema fist fights this is before the days of martial arts which george of course explored himself later on in his career but these are proper fist fights and not only that but peter hunt as an editor is the director and he's editing this as he goes john glenn his director has then had conversations with him and is aware that this fight is r as real as real can be. And we need to move things around a bit. That's why you get lots of cuts. Lots of cuts in these fights where you've suddenly got numerous camera angles. And three punches can have six or seven or eight or nine cuts. To speeding everything up, they then throw those wonderful sound effects on top of it. And this punch that he's delivering, which he throws from way back here. You remember the old John Wayne adage... Uh, which which used to happen in the uh, in the forties onwards. The further that fist came back, the louder the noise was when it made contact. And that's what they've done. They've recreated this and they've given it to a new audience. Um, and he really does sell it. So Honor Majesty is absolutely magnificent. The hotel fight for me is, I think, one of the best things that's ever been captured on film. It's a num. It's firstly, it's a great fight. It's a great fight because it's worked out. Uh, Georgie Leach works it with um, Irvin Allen, who is the other character in the fight, who was a wrestler and a boxer, 
and uh, by all accounts a proper nasty piece of work uh, and wasn't uh, you know overly bothered about using his fists in other types of situation too so the two of them brawling this way and there are a couple of moments in this fight whereby he is thrown about he's wrecking the room it's a simmons fight you know it's that style George, of course, worked with, with Bob very closely, so using the furniture in the room, the table gets smashed. Uh, they go through that... Um, there's like a wooden partition from one side of the room to the other. Crash, that goes. The whole gate crasher routine, right? Um, lamps being thrown, guns being brought out, bang, going off, and the edits are going left, right, and centre. And um, George gets him. Even in the take, where maybe they've run through it, I don't know how many times they would have run through it, but George lamps him, and I think he's got him for real. Irvin has been hit on a number of occasions. You don't have to look at his face to go, you've been slapped before, my friend, haven't you? You just keep going on. And in the middle of a take, if it gets to the stage where, OK, you get chinned, you know, you, you, you know that this one's supposed to miss, but it doesn't, it catches the end of your nose, or in this instance, hits him right on the chin. I mean, he absolutely thumps him. But Irvin's been in enough brawls to know, let's get through the routine, let's keep going. I'm not injured, I'm just a bit A, stunned, B, pissed off, and all that sort of stuff, but we'll talk about it afterwards. Connery used to do the same thing. What was the, uh, uh, Joe Robinson used to say to uh, uh, to Guy Hamilton? He said, you know, when, when Sean hits, he means it. Well, what he meant by that was because it was such a small space that they were fighting in in Diamonds Are Forever, in that uh, recreation of the lift shaft, that pre pretty much every other punch that somebody threw would have been landed. Um, Sean uh, had said on a number of occasions how he used to get clipped from time to time. Stuntmen would go, oop, bang, bang, whoops, sorry, and, and catch hold of him, you know? And then afterwards they'd say, Sean, look, I'm really sorry, I apologise. It's fine, it's no problem, it was all good. And it was all good because there wasn't that moment where somebody delivers a KO. Now, I've seen that happen once before, and the editor has saved the entire sequence. Um, it was an American TV movie. And obviously the budget was relatively small, and they couldn't afford to do retakes. So what's happened is that the actor um, has obviously... There's been a grapple, they've struggled, there's been a couple of body blows, and then there's a right hook to the chin. And he lands this with Tyson capability. Thump. And you can feel that judder. And you can see the blood drain from your man's face and him sort of drop like a stone and his eyes disappear. And you go, oh, he's been nubbed. And then, then the editor dives in and, of course, throws in a cut and a pickup from a previous part of that manoeuvre. And it gives the impression that it's just a glancing blow and that he's managed to get hold of him again but you know for a fact that he's absolutely out cold. Now, these moments happen, and from experience and from being able to take a fair bit of punishment, you kind of get by it, which brings me back to George, who, as we said, more than capable of, of handling himself and proved it. And that fight with Yuri Baryenko was the reason he got the role. And the fight in the hotel room is magnificent. I think is an absolutely perfect example of what what a great find George was for the character of Bond. Now, the story, as we know, meant that George maybe listened to the wrong people. He was influenced in a certain direction and decided this whole thing isn't for me and left. And therefore he had to then find other work and of course he was able to live on the back of being bond for a little while and some of those movie decisions that he did make universal soldier being one of them um allowed you know for a, a, a bit of good feel about the whole thing something that would people the audience would go hey that's the guy that used to be bond you remember him he was good in that, and we were going to watch him in this. Not the greatest action in that picture either. There's a little dust up at the end. But for me, George really uh, picked his game up when he went to Hong Kong. That was a very powerful thing to do as well. How many actors have left a role and have decided 
I'm just going to stick to my guns here, I think. I'm just going to go and, and Europe and Britain and whatever it is, and I'm going to stick to it and I'm going to stick to it. And he didn't. And at some point during um, the visits that he went to in the States or indeed the visits that he went to uh, to Hong Kong, he built up this relationship with um, with Bruce Lee. And between them, and Bruce did this with a number of individuals, uh, with George, James Coburn is another very good example of, of, of an actor who you can see physically change, mentally change, during a period in his life. Look at the Flint movies. Look at the way in which Flint, Derek Flint, fights. It's a very martial arts approach to a standard fist fight. Um, the Saint, for instance, in the original TV series, Roger was he was doing punches. They were having brawls and fighting. In Return of the Saint, that came back in the seventies. Ian Ogilvy's character by that time was doing was hitting we, we were doing karate chops by this time there were martial arts moves and it changed the fight completely and it changed the persona of the character completely George decides Hong Kong is the thing for him and the Hong Kong market that's a very 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 difficult world to get into he was a name you know, he'd been James Bond. So that was going to get him so far. And uh, they wanted to check his ability. Now, obviously, at some point, I don't know the full story, but I believe that in that interim period, he has built up a relationship with Bruce Lee, the greatest of all, who has taken him under his wing and allowed him to just alter something within George's psyche and allow him to think differently about the world of action, about the world of the cinema that he's doing and about him as a human being. And he will say himself, he was a better person because of that. And that relationship with Bruce then made that transition into Hong Kong cinema a little easier. And you can see that from uh, Stoner, which was the first uh, Hong Kong adventure that he did with Angela Mao and then later on The Man from Hong Kong uh, which uh, firstly it's nice because he's the villain of the piece and uh, wasn't it Roger Moore who used to say you know, the, the villains always get the best lines and he's got the best lines, the best sneers you know it's a really angry picture um, and we know about the making of and we know about how complicated uh, the lead actor was um, to work with and uh, how complicated the ho you know the director scenario was so there's a bunch of bits and pieces going on and I think George in that is magnificent and not only that but is put in a number of situations whereby again he has, has to use his physicality now the physicality that he's doing in Stoner Martial arts movements, um, you know, through certain types of very, very speedy choreography, slowed down maybe a touch. As I say, they with a lot of Hong Kong cinema, what they do is they work those moves through slowly, then pick up the speed gently, 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 to the point where, you know, it's very, very quick indeed. Jackie Chan, as you know, or may know, uh, when he did Cannonball Run uh, in 1980, the American stunt guys, uh, of course, working under Bobby Bass and uh, and Hal Needham on the picture, worked through the routines but couldn't do them as fast as he would have liked. And that fight at the at the gas station that takes place where all the bikers are everywhere and Jackie's doing his thing, the movements that Jackie is doing is they're they're very very they're much much slower than you would expect to see in many of his later films. Similarly, here. Um, Sammo Hung, incidentally, is the is the stunt coordinator on Stoner, and um, is you know from the same opera opera school that that Jackie went to. The the, the three of them, him and Yum Bu, and they they all went there, and they they are very familiar with fast, speedy movements, 
and in certain cases you can see there's just a level of that which has to be toned down slightly but it, i mean it's picked up over time and george's accuracy with a great deal of these maneuvers very very good and uh, i thought some of the a lot of the action there was magnificent now there's a lot of physicality in that as well and he's being as physical as he possibly can that's the thing about george never wanting to shy away from you know the possibility of throwing himself here or there very physical role there's a couple of nice little pieces um that uh he did a, a little bit of an interview with um in fact he did an interview with grant page and um i think it was called kung fu killers and they managed to you know, get some time where they could talk to George and, and explore what was going on. And, and um, if I can, if copyright is OK, if I can, I will show you some of that footage. If not, I'll be back in just a moment. Now, a foreign devil like former James Bond, George Lazenby, is currently filming his first Kung Fu movie. Grant asked him how he was getting on. One of my first days here, I was uh, running through a rehearsal and everything seemed fine. I had a few friends around from London that were talking to me in the background. Of course, my concentration wasn't total. I wandered off the set and back on, and I had to step back and dodge one blow, and it stepped aside for the next one. With, uh, and then another guy was coming across from this side, I stepped back this way. Well, I forgot about that character. And I ducked instinctively and got a full blast in the side of the head. So I was spun around, stars going everywhere. And, and that day was dangerous because I was half conscious all day long from that time. It was under my hairline. But my head, you'll notice, was a bit higher on one side so that, for about uh, three days of filming until it settled itself down. It was lucky it wasn't my eye. I think so. I'm going to get Chinese piles laying down here. The Chinese were unsure at first how a Westerner would fit in with their brand of organized chaos, but George soon had a relaxed attitude to the eccentricities of Asian movie making. Well, to me, one of the funniest things, I was reading through the script and I thought, now here's a nice scene for me. I've got this beautiful Chinese lady who's going to lean over me naked and say, uh, uh, George, I love you, blah, 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 I want to make it with you, etc., or whatever they say in Chinese, and uh, leans down and kisses me. When the scene came about, all that happened was they got the camera shooting from the middle of the back up from behind. She walks towards me, and it was hard to keep a straight face because she didn't want to walk around even with her back showing. They're very puritanical here. And so she had the front of a mask with masking tape right down to here and a newspaper right up the front. <laughs> I mean, when you see that coming at you, what do you say? It looked like Ned Kelly without his mask on. I mean, it just turned me right off. George plays an undercover agent, determined to smash an Asian drug syndicate. And in this scene, he's being tortured by the nasties. Well, what you call being uh, overloaded with uh, Spanish fly being tortured. <laughs> well, I guess I'm being tortured, bro. Well. Uh, they're going to give me an injection with uh, sex drug in there, a stimulant. And uh, Mao Ying doesn't get it, because she fakes it with the pills under her tongue, you see. So I'm let loose on poor little Mao Ying, <laughs> loaded to the eyeballs with uh, a sex drive, you know, drugs that you can't control yourself. Should be a lot of fun. All the action sequences are demonstrated first by the martial arts choreographer. Then the star runs through the movements, getting faster and faster each time, until the director is satisfied that he has achieved the required speed. Grant asked him if he'd learned anything from working on the film. Well, the first thing I've learned is uh, to be aware of every Chinese. Because it's like uh, anything, if you practice at it, you become good at it. And, uh, and they've got two arms and two legs the same as everybody else has, but the ordinary fellow in the street will throw a, a left or a right hook or something like that. But these guys will get you coming backwards, sideways, and then their feet are coming, they're like a spike wheel coming at you. And they can get, they'll get you eventually. 
you know, if this one don't get you, then the next one will kind of thing. Well, it's just every way they're coming from. And, and every part of them's a lethal weapon. There's like 24 bits of my arm that I knew I couldn't hit with before, but I can now. And it doesn't hurt me. It's just from hardening it up on bits of working it out. And these two muscles here are as good as those two knuckles there, you know what I mean? And some of the guys here, they can pick your nose with their toes, sort of thing. <laughs> He was a very strong person, you know, mentally strong. Anything you said, apart from the knowing that he could uh, cut you down in three seconds plus with his physical powers, I mean, he was like a, a piece of wire. You know, a couple of times we were grappling together, or you're saying, this muscle's for this, you feel that, and you'd feel it, and it was like feeling a ball of steel when it was rolled up. And he just didn't want to tangle with it. But getting back to him, uh, he had a lot of mental strength. He would concentrate on something, and you would have to concentrate. For instance, he'd have an idea for the picture, and he'd ring up uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. George! Are you there? George! Yes, Bruce. Uh, I've got this idea. What do you think of this? And he'd go on for an hour. And that's a great deal of what was going on, the way in which it's looked upon as being, well, this, this guy... You know, we've got to teach him everything. I don't think you need to teach him everything. He's got that natural instinct about him. It's all that's different is the style of fighting and the choreography, which, of course, he picks up very well. Um, man from Hong Kong, of course, uh, as I mentioned, not only a better role, but certainly from an action perspective, gave him an opportunity to really really be different to the character that we were familiar with him being you know he's the he's the the the, the lead he's the, uh, the handsome hero in this okay he's the villain uh but some of the fights that he gets into incredibly good really very very good and there's that fire sequence and that fire sequence is crazy to be in a situation where as an actor you are convinced either by the director or the stunt coordinator. And I suspect, if I may be honest and brutal about the whole thing, um, uh, Brian Trenchard-Smith, who directed that, probably bit off way more than he could chew, made some sort of suggestion to George and said, look, I'll do it. I'll do it and I'll prove to you that it's OK. And then you'll do it, which, of course, he never did. There's a large section of that which is not George and his Grant Page, who's doing the burn. But there is a moment where he's very clearly on fire and he's trying to get that jacket off. And you can see that he's got protective gel on his hair and stuff and his head because the heat would have been remarkable. And that takes a lot of balls. You know, you don't just stand there and get set on fire. And, well, it'll all be okay. You know, there is always a risk, particularly with fire. So I think that that really is something that, that does need to be looked at. Um, and have a look at it. If you get an opportunity to see it, um, I did have a video, as you may know, about the man from Hong Kong. It was very popular um, and it was uploaded up here. And um, I checked not too long ago because I wanted to have a look and see the whole thing. It's gone. It has disappeared. It has been removed by... Uh, the YouTube copyright police, uh, presumably because somebody has moaned at some point and said, hang on. Uh, but at the time, uh, the episode went out. You may well remember it. I definitely did one. And uh, so there is there was some... I, I tried to get some decent footage of what was going on and to explore what was going on. And there was a great deal going on, and George was right in the thick of it. Because uh, there wasn't only that. There was a car chase on that picture as well, a whole bunch of other bits and pieces, which was just fantastic. So if you do get a chance to see it, watch it and uh, pay close attention to, to the amount of work that George is doing. Um, there's also a thing which I wanted to show you um, and um, <laughs> this is quite nice because it goes back to what I was saying about George being very physical, right? Um, and I believe that this film is called... Is there anybody there? Right? I believe that's what this is called. I have to double check it, but I think that's the case. 
and he's playing the kind of lead through the picture and it's to do with a relationship and it's to do with um, some issues that have happened during between two other people and him and this other girl they're investigating what's going on um, and then he is lured to a building at the end and um, well he's shot and this is the shot they use in the film. Check this out. It's like he's been hit with a shotgun or a cannon flying through the air. Um, I mean, that's magnificent. And that's maybe an opportunity for George to go, right, I think I'm just going to throw, I'm just going to launch myself here. And he launches himself. He launches himself backwards. He goes through the air and lands in a big heap on the sofa the other side. And if that may have been one shot. They've, they've covered it with a couple of cameras. But that's very physical, you know. The, in the in the script, it would probably have said, gets to door, gunshots from the other side of the door, or the door opens and gunshots, and you fall to the floor. And uh, that's how George has interpreted that particular piece of direction, and I think that's brilliant. And that really, again, goes to some way of explaining why George Lazenby is a very, very exciting uh, uh, purveyor of the big right hand because he throws these things like you wouldn't believe but it's also something that I spotted from those Honor Majesty's days whereby moments like the you know so we, we have the John Wayne thing holding the punch back coming right into camera and the further the arm comes back the heavier the punch will be there's a sound effect on top of that who then uses that later on in a similar sort of vein Indiana Jones. Those fights where those punches turn up like, um, you know, like you're, you're throwing a brick through a plate glass window. Crunch! And the, 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 the gun that never needs reloading. You know, all of that type of stuff. That's those type of traits which have been picked up from George. George is a huge influence on many of those action stars uh, of that period. And later on, who and directors, you know, um, Tarantino has said that uh, Honor Majesties is certainly one of his favourite Bond pictures and he loves George and that type of action you know really really enjoying what was going on there and I think that's that's very interesting to look at the way in which people remember the, the, the Bond franchise for being the Connery pictures and the Roger Moore pictures and um, and everything that's gone in between but they they go, you know, poor old George, you know. Well, never mind poor old George. George is doing very well, thank you very much. And I think on the strength of that, certainly, um, he was very influential in the way in which action moved on. You know, he was just magnificent. And uh, uh, from a from a punch pound for pound thing, I, I, I don't think you could get better. I really believe that. So next time you watch Honor Majesties, or indeed any one of those other movies from George's back catalogue, go and explore them. There's a couple of belters there. Later on in life, of course, he gets slightly more mainstream. Glory, for instance. That was a very um, a Civil War picture and, a, and, a, and a, an extraordinary performance by him. Saint Jack is another one later on down the line. Um, so there's a number of pictures you should check out uh, with George Lazenby because uh, I think he's a real unsung action hero. Um, and uh, worth his weight in gold when it comes to being able to fight his way out of a corner. Uh, Yuri Boryenko probably remembered that more than anything else, uh, with that poor broken nose of his, and those endless photographs of claret being pumped all over the place. Poor old bugger. Um, so that's about it. 
Um, I wanted to uh, to say a huge thank you to everybody for supporting the podcast. 100 episodes. Let's go for another 100, shall we, and, and uh, see how things get on. If you haven't already checked out the Pod Dojo Network, do that. They are also responsible for those podcasts. The link is in the description below. The LinkedIn, click that. LinkedIn, not LinkedIn. Linktree, I beg. I was, I was got those mixed up. I thought they were connected at one point. Shows you how much I pay attention very clearly link tree the link is down there click on that that's all of my social medias and the pod dojo network there as well we'll be back next week for more of the same and until then i'll bid you a fond adieu bye for now